I'm Mark Golub. Thank you for joining us again for more of Shalom TV's exclusive American television coverage of Israel in turmoil. If you've not heard yet, the Israeli Defense Forces have sent ground troops into Gaza. There's a great deal of speculation as to whether this would happen or not, but earlier today, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu did decide that the troops were necessary, and we reported that to you about 4.30 when Ron Jacobson went on the air. But for the latest of the progress of the IDF in this operation, we're pleased to have on our phones from Israel once again Lieutenant Libby Weiss, spokesperson for the IDF. Libby, I can't thank you enough for joining us again. Of course. Thank you for having me. All right, Libby, obviously all of us want to know where do things stand now. But wait, what was the objective and what was the sort of the, the straw that pushed, that broke the capital's back and pushed Israel into using ground troops? It became clear to us that in the last 10 days that we were engaged in this conflict with Hamas, that at no point uh, when Hamas had several opportunities to de-escalate, to stop firing rockets, it became very clear to us that Hamas had no interest in doing so, that on the contrary, during times of potential ceasefire opportunities for de-escalation, Hamas continued to fire rockets. And it was really that uh, understanding that, that eventually led to this decision uh, to bring troops in the ground in Gaza. Libby, we have seen reports that the ground offensive at the moment has as its mission the elimination of tunnels that Hamas has used to enter Israel. And evidently, there was a, an incursion near Kibbutz Sufa uh, earlier today in, the, in southern Israel, and that the goal is to knock out these tunnels. To what extent is that something that we should understand? The tunnels play a crucial threat and really the many threats that Israel faces coming from Hamas. Uh, as you mentioned, the tunnels are a strategic asset that Hamas has. They are they've been built over time, and just in the last year and a half, we've actually exposed at least four of these tunnels. And at the end of the day, our responsibility is to, to defend the citizens of this country. And these types of tunnels that allow for Hamas terrorists to infiltrate into Israel poses a serious, serious threat. So it is accurate to say that we are targeting these tunnels as well as other assets of Hamas and the Gaza Strip. Okay. You know, this, by the way, for our audience, that are the tunnels which Israel has uncovered. And again, this is how Hamas basically enters into the land of Israel, state of Israel. Uh, Libby, we have also been told that it is... It's not only going to be hard for the Palestinians because the IDF is very, very good at what it does. At the same time, it is also difficult for IDF soldiers to go house to house to house, and it involves a different kind of warfare. And I wonder if you could talk to us about how the IDF feels about that and how you hope to avoid as many, A, civilian casualties, at the same time to avoid any casualties within the IDF. Conflict, any type of conflict uh, that our soldiers are engaged in is challenging uh, and tough, and certainly there are a lot of additional threats and challenges when fighting in an urban area, both in terms of the challenges that our soldiers face and the general task of making sure it causes minimal harm to the civilian population as possible. And we understand that this is the reality of the, the conflict that we're fighting in Gaza, and we make sure to invest in as much training of our soldiers as possible to deal with these threats. Uh, the civilian population in Gaza is absolutely not our target. Yes. We made that clear from the very first day of this operation. We continue to do so, and we continue to use measures such as sending them text messages and, and calling them, asking them to leave their homes that are not used anywhere else in the world, really to underline that commitment that we have. Uh, Libby, I also want to have you comment on a human, watch, a human rights watch report that got a lot of play here in the New York Times and in America, where Human Rights Watch said that Israel has repeatedly struck civilians and their property without a clear military purpose, and they called these attacks unlawful attacks called on Israel to end them, that Israel has hit homes, offices, farmlands in Gaza. 
uh, with F-16 airstrikes, missiles fired from Apache, Apache helicopters, and shelling from naval gunboats. Is there any comment you can make on behalf of the IDF when you hear this is the way um, a human watch group and the way in which the American media is reporting on this war? Uh, I have a serious issue with the, the premise in the first place. Uh, we have absolutely no interest in targeting the civilians of Gaza, and I think the measures that we take speak to that entirely. Uh, I think really what's unlawful here, if we're going to be using that term, is, is what Hamas does to its own civilian population. At the end of the day, Hamas uses its civilian population knowingly and willingly, puts rocket uh, launchers, rockets, other military assets in the heart of civilian civilian areas. And that, that to me, is unlawful. And I, I would say that by any international standard, that is unlawful. Libby, I always appreciate, I know it's very late where you are in Israel right now. I always appreciate your finding a way to give us a few moments. I hope we don't need to keep turning to you, but we will as long as this operation continues. Thank you very much for the time. Okay, thank you. Be well. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Lieutenant Libby Weiss, who is a spokesperson for the IDF. And again, you know, what can she tell us? All she can tell us is, you know, she can give us a feel for what the IDF is involved in now. And, and I think it's important that you get to hear somebody from the IDF itself. And so we're glad that Libby can come on, and I, I thank her very, very much. Um, I want to talk to you for one quick moment about something that I saw in the New York Times, which just was so upsetting to me and I got an email from someone who alerted me to it but anybody who's seen the New York Times knows what I'm going to talk about. Uh, there was basically a story on the front page of the New York Times. In fact, let me just see if I can find my notes. Yeah, uh, and this was done by Ann Bernard yesterday uh, in the New York Times and it was called Boys Drawn to Gaza Beach and into the center of Middle East strife. And there you can see it, although it's, it's really hard to read, Sloan, but what it says is, boys drawn to Gaza Beach and into center of Middle East strife. And uh, I don't know if we have the picture itself. If we do, we should show the picture. But it's a picture that shows, any, a, there we go, a, a picture of a dead Palestinian boy on the beach. And this article that you're seeing now from the New York Times was the most tweeted New York Times piece of the day, the second most viewed, and the second most posted on Facebook. And my own feeling is that there is something insidious about the way the New York Times, and yes, I'm going after the New York Times now, they represent something. It's, just, it's not just the New York Times. But the New York Times here has, has taken a story and has made it look like in pictures, you know, somebody emailed me, a picture is worth a thousand words. So if you see the picture of, a, of tragedy, but, but wait, it's tragic if an Israeli youth, and there were four of them, four Israeli youths were victims of an Israeli airstrike, of an, of an Israeli bomb or missile, on the beach, and Israel said it was trying to hit a, a, a structure where they believed there were uh, armament, armaments being held. But it's tragic for any civilian, civilian child to die in war. But when you put that on the front page of the New York Times as if that's the story, it can, in, it can sway public opinion having nothing to do with the facts. And the actual story, I'm going to read you a portion of the story. The four dead boys came quickly to symbolize how the Israeli aerial assaults in Gaza are inevitably killing innocents in this crowded, impoverished sliver of land among the, along the Mediterranean Sea. They stood out because they were inarguably blameless. Children who simply wanted to play on their favorite beach, near the fishing port where their large extended family keeps its boats. And then it goes on to say, 
The killings also crystallized the conundrum for the 1.7 million Gazans trapped between Israel's powerful military machine, Israel's powerful military machine, and the militants, not terrorists, the militants of Hamas and its affiliates, who fire rockets into Israel with little regard for how the response affects Gazans. Virtually imprisoned by the border controls of Israel, and increasingly Egypt, most Gazans have nothing to do with the perennial conflict, but cannot escape it. That was the commentary from the New York Times. That's how the, the New York Times slants the story. And there's no headline. There's nothing, nothing in the story that basically says the following. If I had written the headline, here's the way the headline would have read. Hamas causes four deaths on Gaza beach. I want to say it again. Hamas causes, Hamas responsible for, four young deaths on Gaza beach. Understand, the only reason Israel is engaged in airstrikes is that Hamas is firing rockets into Israel. Those kids are victims caused by Hamas rocket strikes into Israel. The Israeli airstrikes would stop in a heartbeat if Hamas stopped firing its rockets into Israel. But does anybody doubt that? Hamas refused two ceasefires, not one. Uh, Israel agreed to two ceasefires, and Hamas rejected both. By the way, Israel suspended all operations for six hours after the first ceasefire. And Hamas rejected both, both ceasefires. What does the New York Times... What does anyone expect Israel to do? Israel's job is to protect its citizens. If Hamas wants to protect its citizens, stop firing rockets, and those four kids would still be alive. And no Israeli rejoices. I was with Shlomo Riskin this afternoon. Shlomo Riskin is the chief rabbi of Efrat. You may know him. He's on Shalom TV every Friday evening doing a Dvar Torah before, the, before we go to Central Synagogue with live services. Shlomo Riskin is on every Saturday morning. You've seen him on L'chaim. He, you know, he's one of the leading rabbis in the world. I'm sitting with Shlomo Riskin this afternoon. You'll see it on L'chaim. His heart breaks when Palestinian kids are the victims of Israel doing only one thing, defending itself. And the New York Times and American television and every news source should put this in proper context. Hamas causes four teenage, child, young deaths on Gaza Beach because that's where the blame lies. There's, that's where the responsibility lies. And I get, an, I get a, I don't remember if it was a tweet, an email. I mean, uh, I, I love the fact that so many of you now are in dialogue with me and are watching Shalom TV and appreciate Shalom TV. Again, it means the world to me. But uh, I get an email or a tweet, and basically it's, it's Mark, you're one-sided. Mark, you're one-sided. And my answer was, What's the other side? Anybody who has seen Shalom TV, anybody who's been with me for any length of time, you know both, more than two sides are shown on Shalom TV all the time. And I, have argue, I argued yesterday. I argue all the time. It's very important that American Jews, that Israeli Jews, that Americans in general understand there is a Palestinian perception. I argue that doesn't make it, doesn't mean Palestinians are right. 
It doesn't matter if they're right, though. We have to understand them. And we should understand their claims and their grievances. But in this instance, what's the other side? And I remind you of, a, of a, an, incident, an, incident, an incident I once had with Hans Morgenthau, who was the great political scientist in the, through the 60s and 70s in the State Department. And Morgenthau, in an interview with me on L'Chaim, I was a kid, says to me, you know, tragically, there isn't always room for compromise. It, and his example was, if somebody said to you, I want to sleep with your wife every night, and you said, what are you, out of your mind? I'm not going to let you sleep with my wife every night. Okay, the other person says, we'll compromise. How about every other night? And Morgenthau's point, with, to, point to me was, sometimes there is no compromise. Now, I believe there can be compromise on how you handle Israeli-Palestinian relationships. And some people think I'm wrong, but I still believe in it. And again, Shlomo Riskin believes in it. But in this instance, in this instance, what's the other side? What's the compromise? Israel didn't start this. The world permitted Hamas to rain rockets down on Israel. That's just fact. The world did not express outrage, did not condemn, did not say to Hamas, you can't fire, but we're not a ray. You can't fire one. You can't fire. It's, it's impermissible. You break not only international law, you break every standard of civilized relationships between nations. If you fire a missile into another country. That is a formal act of war. Why has the world permitted Hamas to do this? It's not only Hamas, Islamic jihadist groups in, in Gaza. How has the world permitted this? How has the world permitted this? And then Israel defends itself, and it uses its military might. What should it use? And civilians suffer and civilians die, and four kids out on a beach were the victims. They were not victims of Israel. They were victims of Hamas. And that's what the newspaper should be saying, what television should be saying, what every one of you who ever talks to a friend should be saying. It's tragic. Don't miss that. It's tragic that these civilians, that these kids died on a beach. But it doesn't show anything about Israeli cruelty Nothing. It shows Hamas cruelty. And that's what should be said time after time after time. And there is no other side. In certain instances like this, there is no other side. And it just boggles my mind that this isn't the message we hear on American television every day, everywhere you go. You shouldn't have to come to Shalom TV. And we have our bias. Of course we have our bias. It's, our bias is pro-Israel. But in this instance, everybody should be pro-Israel. Everybody. Every television channel, every news organization, every newspaper, every magazine, there should be one universal call. Hamas, stop it. And every Palestinian death is on Hamas, not on Israel. I want to go to our phones because I have a remarkable human being on the, on the line right now. Rabbi Marvin Heyer is both the founder and head of the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles, California. The Simon Wiesenthal Center is one of the world's leading international organizations dedicated to combating hate and bigotry of all kind, promoting human rights and dignity of all human beings, and yes, defending the safety of Israel and Jews worldwide. Marvin, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Marvin, did you see the story in the New York Times that I'm referring to? <clears throat> uh, yes, um, if I can add, Please. I would only tell you one thing. Please. <clears throat> that in this case, you had... Two editorials, one in the Times, the New York Times in New York, and the other in the L.A. Times in Los Angeles, 
which virtually said the same thing, which is making the case as if Israel was equal to Hamas, mm-hmm. which is just unbelievable. Unbelievable. And you know, you know, I heard what you said, and I, I applaud what you said. Uh, you know, just now to your listeners. Let me, let me, let me just say the following. That is very important, and that is the world has forgotten. Everybody, the ultimate war that everybody would agree was good versus evil was the Second World War of the Allies against the Nazis. But forgotten in this drama is the fact that when the Allies landed in Normandy, and there's no question about which side was right and which side was the ultimate example of evil. In the first week of the D-Day operations in Normandy, 40,000 civilians lost their lives in collateral damage. 40,000. And the world has to know that war is, we just do not have war down to a science. Israel the morality of how Israel behaves, I've never seen any country in the world re- relate to war with that kind of ethics and morality. But we have to remember the time, the editors of the Times have to know, war is not precise. We don't have the instruments to say, aha, you see, there's a bunker underneath this building of rockets. However, we want you to guarantee that you will only hit apartment 2B and nobody else. Mm-hmm. Israel mm-hmm. tries, but unfortunately, miss, 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 this is a war. It's not a, you know, it's not a peaceful exercise. So for the world to fault Israel, what other country spends the time to send warnings and to, to, takes its military personnel in all the areas, commandos, air force, Naval, it all tells them you have to be concerned about warning the population before you start any any kind of an attack. Mm -hmm. Never unheard of in the history of warfare. Mm -hmm. And the New York Times and the L.A. Times still want to equate uh, or or fault Israel and equate both sides. Mm -hmm. It's simply unbelievable. Marvin, your organization, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, has dedicated itself to the eradication of hate and bigotry and a certain kind of venality in the world, and you've also tried to fight anti-Semitism. To what extent is the way in which this conflict is being portrayed and the way in which the media tries to say that there's no difference between Hamas and Israel, and in this instance, both the LA Times and the New York Times, make Israel out to be the bad guy. To what extent, Marvin, is this a symptom of contemporary anti-Semitism. It's both contemporary anti-Semitism and a double standard. I'm a New Yorker. I was born on the Lower East Side. Whenever I drive in New York, if I'm going down near, near the United Nations building, I have a general clow. My general clow is the following. If the lights are on at night, at, let's say at 7 o'clock and 8 o'clock, and you drive by and you see all the lights on in the United Nations, You know that a resolution is being put forth to condemn Israel. That's the only time the United Nations is open at night, with all the lights on. (laughs) That's the way it has been from the very beginning, when the United Nations tried to put forth the, the rule that Zionism is racism. One country in the world. For example, what is the plague? We are paying trillions of dollars on planes, going through airports all because of terrorism. So we ask the question, if terrorism is such a plague and it costs the world so much money every day, we can't travel anymore because terrorism has changed the world. Let's ask, has the United Nations passed a resolution that terrorism is a crime against humanity, condemning the various terrorist organizations, which would include Hamas by name? Never done it. Mm -hmm. Skip the issue. Mm -hmm. Other things can get the attention of the United Nations. But the plague of the 21st century terrorism, 
Yes, they will mention terrorism. So why don't you have a resolution condemning those who practice it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The answer is the place is dominated by 54 or 55 Muslim states who won't vote for such a resolution. You know, Marvin, we're seeing, without any question, a, an epidemic, a, a scourge, a plague of anti-Semitism erupting throughout Western Europe, Western Europe. It's not only Eastern Europe, it's Western Europe. And we recently had a, a leader of the French Jewish community on. He was from Paris. He was describing what his life was like. By the way, Marvin, it's almost like French Jews are becoming accustomed to it and are sort of adjusting their life to a certain level of anti-Semitism. Marvin, you know, this is, one, this is something which I once thought would never raise its head, would never be permitted in Western countries. And now it is something that is taken for granted. You're, you personally, not only the Simon Wiesenthal Center, but you personally have been trying to speak out against global anti-Semitism your entire professional career. What do you make of the fact that I'm asking you two things, Marvin? One, what do you make of the fact that anti-Semitism of this nature has reared its head in such an ugly way throughout Western Europe? And number two, what do you make of the fact that Jews in, in Western Europe, if they're not fleeing, they sort of try to make excuses for why this is part of their life, as opposed to saying, you know, this is, in, this is unacceptable, our governments must stop it, I don't want to hear about the extreme Islamic population that has come into France or Paris or England. I don't want to hear about it. It is not permissible for anti-Semitism to exist, and Marvin, it does. What's, how do you personally you know, make sense of it all? Well, for, first let me say, I said, uh, you know, uh, it, I've said this many times. Uh, history has shown that for more than a half a century... There's been no price to pay anywhere in the world for the initiators of terrorism in the Middle East. Only the responders face international condemnation. And they're not the initiators. And let me tell you something interesting. Two weeks ago, we, were, uh, we had a meeting with, in the Elysee Palace with President Talam. Yes. And Baron de Rothschild attended the meeting, one of the leaders of French Jewry. Yes. It was an, uh, about a 40-minute meeting. And the issue was the jihadists, the attack on the museum, the attack on the Jewish school. What's happening in France? Um, the president, to his credit, he's been very strong on Israel and very strong in speaking out on anti-Semitism. But I asked him this question. I said, Mr. President, isn't it true? And I, and I, that was before the incident, what happened in Israel. I said, Mr. President... It is a fact, if there ever was such a thing as Jewish terrorists, and they, heaven forbid, committed a crime against a school, against children, blew up a bus, every responsible Jewish leader in the world would condemn it outright as a violation of, what every, of everything that Judaism stands for. But how is it possible that you have six million Muslims in France? And have you heard, Mr. President, any of the imams, have they come out against the attack, against the museum, and against the Jewish school in comparison to the numbers? I'm not talking about one or two or three imams. Isn't it true that there's total silence? And the president... I thought he was going to, you know, he lives in France and he's the president of a country that he would cite statistics that I didn't see. Yes. He did not, he did not refute it. He said, basically, this is one of our problems. Mm-hmm. No leadership willing mm-hmm. to speak out. And it's a great tragedy. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and that's right. In the heart of Western Europe, the Jewish community, I was speaking to Baron de Rothschild, a great defender of French Jewry, he, he's never seen anything like it, and is very concerned about the turn that has, has isolated the Jewish community of France. Mm-hmm. And what about the fact that 
Jews in France seem to be, you know, willing to accept it. Well, they're not, they're frightened. That I can tell you. There's a great deal of fear, and the statistics that you point out, the amount that going to Israel is going to continue. Well, it will reach higher proportion. Okay. But it's not such good news. No, it is not. Why do I say it's not such good news? Because if you look at it, I don't mean that it's not good news that they're going to Israel. Of course, that's always good news that Israel strengthens its population base. But what's not good is that we have to withdraw in terms of geography. Like yes. there are many people who say to me, so what? So the Jews will leave Europe. So where, where will Jews be permitted in the 21st and 22nd century? Right. We'll have three countries to go to. <laughs> right, right. Marvin, you're... I mean, that's not such great news. No, it is in, not. In, in an age of progress. <laughs> no. Marvin, you've been doing fabulous work at the Simon Wiesenthal Center, and it's always a pleasure to speak with you. I know, by the way, you had to rearrange things to be on with us tonight. I'm very, very grateful. When you're in New York next time, we have to sit together in studio. In the meantime, all the best to you. You do, again, fabulous work. Continue your great work, too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Marvin Heyer, founder and dean of the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles, California. And again, the Simon Wiesenthal Center is, you know, renowned for fighting about all forms of bigotry, not simply anti-Semitism. We're going to have one more guest in a moment who I'm very, very anxious to uh, speak with. And then we're going to take some phone calls as we go up to the rest of the hour towards uh, 8 o'clock. So actually, at, at some point, Sloan, as we're talking... To Malcolm, I want you to put the phone number up, 201-242-1142. I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on what we're discussing here tonight. But right now, I want to go to a a gentleman who is, in in essence, leading American Jewry. And in some way, he's leading world Jewry. He is the executive vice chairman. He is the professional at the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, which is the umbrella group that represents us on issues having to do with Israel and Jews in foreign countries. And for many, many years, when anyone in Washington or anybody in the White House wanted a sense of what mainstream Jewish thinking was, they would call upon the Conference of Presidents. And the conference draws a chairman every two years from among its ranks. And the again, the professional who's been there now for more than 25 years and has done a spectacular job is somebody I, you know, I'm in love with, and I always have him on whenever I can on Shalom TV. Malcolm Honline, Malcolm, again, thanks for making some time for Shalom TV and, and sharing your wisdom with us. Always my pleasure to talk to you and to hear all the wonderful compliments. <laughs> I could go on and on. You're the best. I, <laughs> I can go on and on. Malcolm, uh, have you had a chance to see the story that I'm talking about in the New York Times? The one about the. Uh, Kider boy, or the attack on the beach? The attack on the beach. Listen, the Times record in this will be a subject for real exploration, and in fact, I've been just talking about a meeting with the editorial board. I don't know if it'll do any good, because I do believe that this is a policy decision. This is not haphazard. Mm -hmm. The fact that you see the pattern of coverage of, of all of this war, but the Times is uh, is amongst the worst, but it's not alone. CNN, many others. And frankly, it is because the blood and the gore is what people are looking for. And if this is the price we have to pay for the fact that Israel didn't have casualties thanks to Iron Dome, not because the Hamas didn't want to create as much havoc and kill as many Jews as possible, but because they didn't succeed, this is the price then it's one I think we should be willing to pay. Absolutely. It's not one we should have to pay. Yes, that is right. that's right. We shouldn't have to pay in Israeli blood. By the way, just out of curiosity, if a Hamas rocket killed an Israeli teen on a beach in Tel Aviv, do you think the New York Times would run the story and the picture the same way? They're looking for Israeli uh, victims, but and are disappointed not to find them. And, and we've seen mockery on some of the shows. That we've seen uh, degradation of the fact that there aren't enough Israeli uh, casualties, and that Israel, because they spent the time and money over the last years to defend their citizens, while the others look to ways to put their citizens in harm's way, that Hamas built all this infrastructure under houses, mosques, hospitals 
all these facilities to launch missiles from and did nothing to develop Gaza to improve the lives of their people. And then you hear all of the crocodile tears about the plight of the Gazans. I feel for the Gazans, but the blame is Hamas. They are yes. the victims of Hamas, yes. not of Israel. Yes. And no one has proven yet where the, the rocket came from that hit the beach. I was in Tel Aviv uh, yesterday, and we saw and heard the rockets coming in, and people on the beach who could have easily been in danger because there's not enough time to to get out and get the 30 seconds or whatever to to a shelter. The fact is no one left the water and no one left the beach. <laughs> they have enough confidence in the systems that protect them. It's a little overconfidence, but but I think it's their people are missing the fundamental point in all this, and the Times exacerbates it in a deliberate way that here you have one side that lives to kill. Israel sometimes has to kill to live. Mm -hmm. But their purpose is to protect, think of it, over 1,500 sorties, and you have, what, 200 dead claimed. We don't know the real numbers, but that's what the Palestinians claim. Think of it. If, 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 if America had 1,500 sorties over a country, if any of the Arab countries would have had a chance to five, four, fifteen hundred sorties, you would have had thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of casualties. That's a very important point, by the way. And when people speak of disproportionate force, they don't understand that it's proportionate to the number of actions, how many civilian deaths are there. And your point is that even though every death is tragic, the number of civilians who have died in Gaza is the lowest percentage of civilian deaths of any army in the world and in history. For all those who argue about proportionality, the next time a bank is robbed by one bank robber, then we should only send one policeman, mm -hmm. because you've got to have proportionality. And if they kill the bank robber, they also have to kill one of the hostages, or God forbid, one of the policemen, or whatever. This is this illogic of the argument is so astounding. When you look at any war where they beat the Nazis, many more Germans died than people in Britain. Does that mean that they should have should not have bombed them? They shouldn't have st taken the steps necessary to stop the war and to to do what what uh, every country must do to protect its citizens. And it, and frankly, if you go and you see, as we did this week, the it's, they wrote in Ashkel and Ashdod, the courage of the people, the the, the true Zionism that manifest in, in the purest form of absolute commitment, not fear, not nobody sits there and worries about themselves. They ask you always about how are the people in other places where you visited doing, how are they doing. You don't see people walking around along faces, and, and we had dinner in Ashkelon uh, close to midnight with the citizens of the city, and they told us it was the first time that they had a you know real break in days. But they were so uplifting, and they were so... Sure, and so, and, and we came to encourage them, and they gave us courage. We came to assure them, they reassured us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How long were you in Israel recently? Well, I was there last week, and then this week I was there again for yes. days with 30 people from the conference representing different organizations. Yes. And uh, we had so many remarkable experiences from the government, and especially in the field, but most of all with Mrs. Frankel, the mother of one of the three boys whose courage, whose strength, whose spirituality is so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's beyond my words, my ability to describe in words. Mm -hmm. Malcolm, I want you to comment on one more element of this. And there are so many ways I could frame the question. You know, I was telling the audience earlier that I got a, a I don't remember now whether it was an email or a tweet where somebody was saying to me that I have been one-sided. And on Shalom TV, there is often, and you know this because you watch and we've talked about it often, there are many views given on Shalom TV. You can hear a Mort Klein, you can hear a Peter Beinert. Both are going to be on Shalom TV. But in this particular instance, I don't see two sides. To me, Every now and then, something is about as clear, crystal clear as it can be. And I want to know what your reaction is when you hear what your response would be. What your response is when those, even within the Jewish world, say something like this. You understand that the Palestinians are doing this out of frustration because they are an occupied people 
and there is an a, there is an oppressive Israeli occupation on the West Bank, and basically Israel is imprisoning the Palestinian residents of Gaza by blockading uh, Gaza itself. And even you know you talked about it. Even John Stewart on the Daily Show on Monday just hammered Israel. One of the things he said was when Israel gives warning to Gazans, where are they supposed to go? There's a blockade here, there's a blockade there. What does Israel say? Swim for it as if the only thing a Gazan could do is actually leave the country. But there are people who, who argue that Israel is to blame because it is oppressing Palestinians and is still engaged in an occupation. What do you say to them? Your last sentence, Israel is, that's why it's blamed. It's not because of what Israel does. It's mm -hmm. its existence that becomes the challenge. And those who try to couch their, their words and their charges against Israel now, including, unfortunately, some that purport to be you know, pro-peace, pro-Israel, and equate the arsonist and the firefighter, equate a country defending its citizens with those engaged in the worst form of terrorism, and... Uh, and nobody of these uh, elements ever stresses the tons and tons of food, fuel, medicine that go in every day, even now, into the Gaza Strip from Israel. They, they talk about the deprivation and denial. When Israel left, if you remember, nine years ago, so there is no occupation of Gaza anymore. There's not one troop, one soldier, except for the ones who went in today. There were no troops in Gaza before this. The, the uh, Egyptians have blocked them off because they recognize that they pose a threat to Egypt, that they, the tunnels, the smuggling tunnels, which Morsi and even Mubarak tolerated, are, are uh, two-way streets with weapons and all sorts of terrible things being transported, that the, the, uh, the Israelis, Hanias, the head of Hamas, his mother-in-law, was treated in Israel just a few weeks before this fighting started. His granddaughter was treated there. Thousands and thousands of Gazans come to, to get medical treatment in Israel. How come they don't tell that story? Mm -hmm. And then how come they don't tell that Israel went in today because they found tunnels that go a mile into Israel, a mile, and they were, and 13 guys, terrorists, were inside one going to a kibbutz of 150 people to carry out a massacre. Now tell me what country in the world then should be equated, the one who tries to stop terrorists from murdering women and children, or one who uses pinpoint uh, 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 bombings, who you targets exactly the launching pads, and that the fact that it's a war crime what Hamas does, putting those launching pads next to civilian populations, inside houses, inside underneath the mosques and churches, is that Israel's responsibility? It has an obligation to take them out, to protect their citizens, but they give them warnings. And the question just raised about Stuart's comment about where did it go, today and yesterday, they leafleted the areas in advance. Tell me what other army does this, mm -hmm. or tells a specific house, calls them and says, you have five minutes, get out, because we're going to hit this place, because it's a, it's, it's a, um, it is a, 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 a material place where uh, either storage of weapons or rockets were fired and a military target. The, 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 uh, uh, the tunnels, the rockets, these are all part of a Hamas terrorist infrastructure where the money was invested there rather than with the people, that Israel continues to send all of this humanitarian aid and all of the assistance. They didn't cut off the water. They didn't cut off the electricity. They didn't do many things because they don't want to have collective punishment. They leafleted the area and told the people exactly where to go. So he, Mr. Stewart doesn't have to worry. There are plenty of places yes. in Gaza that are open where they can go. Exactly. It, it is not the most, you know that Manhattan is more densely populated than Gaza. So this myth about, you know, the most densely populated place on earth, they ought to check the facts. Malcolm, you know, <laughs> I tell it to you all the time, but I mean it so profoundly. No one says it like you. You, are, you have done, you continue to be an incredible voice. And you lead us, and it is always wonderful that when I call, you go out of your way to make time for us. But it's very important that people get a chance to hear you as much as possible. Please permit me to keep chasing you, Malcolm. We'll talk again very soon. Anytime and always. Thank you, and Malcolm. And let's hope next time we can talk about peace. Exactly right. Wonderful things. Thank you, my friend. Be well. Now, 
Malcolm Honline, Executive Vice Chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. We're going to go to our phones in one second. Uh, maybe we can put the, yes, the phone number's up there for you, 201-242-1142. Um, by the way, you've heard me sort of half serious challenge Bill O'Reilly. When people say, why Bill O'Reilly? He has the leading cable news show on cable television. And I keep saying, why is it day after day after day? Bill Riley never talks about Hamas and the assault on Israel. And I kept saying, you know, I want Bill to deal with this issue. So tonight, we've just been told, Bill, Re Bill O'Reilly will finally deal with the Israeli Hamas situation. And this is what he says, as the world drifts towards war in the Middle East, drifts towards war, Bill? As the world drifts towards war in the Middle East, why do so many Americans refuse to pay attention? Including you. But Bill, you're going to stop. You're going to stop avoiding the issue. And I'm thrilled that Bill O'Reilly tonight will finally pay attention. Why do so many Americans refuse to pay attention? I hope Bill answers the rhetorical question. At the moment, we're going to go to our phones, and I'm thrilled to bring in from Mawa, New Jersey, Anna. Anna, are you, are you there? Yes, I am. Anna, what is your comment? Papa uh, Gallup. Yes. You know, I've been trying to get you for quite a, some time. Well, I'm glad you're here through. tonight. Thank I you. think you're wonderful, oh. and I think what you're saying is what I think, and, and, and that's how I see it. I want you you're to right. say it. The media in on TV. Yes. It's horrible. They're one-sided. And they, it's such a, in a way, to, in such a way of saying it, that they don't finish it and they don't follow through. They're uh, one-sided. And they're, they're, they're uh, if these are my, our professionals on the media, we're in trouble. That's one. The other thing I have to tell you, I do come from World War II. But I have to mention that when Russia was fighting um, Afghanistan, yes, and uh, they w they were getting out, one of the generals. It was on the news. Uh, what was it? Nineteen seventy something, and he said, "Wait." He said it to the United States. Wait till you start because we were going into it. He said, "They're going to put the women and children in front of you. Mm -hmm. Now shoot them." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the, the terrorists. This is what he was wanting them, but mm -hmm. nobody listens. Mm -hmm. Nobody listens. Well, that's one. The other reason, you mentioned, I don't want to forget things at my age. You mentioned Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly is not an honest broker mm -hmm. on TV. Do you remember when they killed the doctor, the, the abortion clinic? Sure. On TV, he said, well, he's a killer. Not the killer who killed the doctor, but the doctor is a killer. Mm -hmm. This is how the answer was. By the way, uh, in all fairness, I don't want here to debate Bill, Bill O'Reilly no, in I'm general. I'm I'm only, I'm, my character. criticism of Bill was that he says that he deals with all issues that are important to America, and I wanted him to address this because he has an enormous audience, and I was very disappointed that night after night after night, all he was doing was taking any issue where he could hammer his own points, but he wasn't dealing with an issue that was of real significance to a large percentage, A, of Americans, and B, the world. Anna, in any case, thank you so much. I'm glad you got through, and I hope you'll call again. Our number is 201-242-1142, and we're going to go to a friend again, Newark, New Jersey. Robert, welcome back to Shalom TV. Good evening, Rabbi. How I are you today? I can call one. I'm very upset. Please. I feel like I've been dropped from a strange planet. The world seems to me it's inside out, upside down. I have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it. It's mm -hmm. just pitiful. I wish sometime I could talk rationally and slower, but I, whenever I call you, I'm so upset. I but, understand. Like the American people, they have to understand Israel has no choice. I feel for everyone. I feel for members of Hamas that lose their life because they're following a misled ideology. But if we look back, 
how did the United States win the war against Japan? When they wouldn't listen, we bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They were cities. They were not military targets. Sometimes that's just what you have to do. I know. There's no compassion in the world. With all the Arab countries around Israel, with all their concern with the Palestinians, especially Egypt, who just brokered a ceasefire and got their thumb their nose at it, can't one of these neighboring nations get the people out of Gaza so Israel can go in and clean out the terrorists and then bring them back? It's Maybe not likely, Robert. Questions. It's not likely. It's an interesting idea, but it's not likely. And, but I appreciate that you call so often. Please, you're always welcome, and you always make excellent points. The, at the same time, the frustration you express is the frustration I feel. I don't feel it with the American people. I feel it with the American media. Yeah. It's, inter it's interesting. I do not feel Americans are, are less sensitive. In fact, most Americans I speak with, they sort of share my surprise and my shock, but it's still inappropriate. And we live in a country where the American media should be more sensitive to what the reality is, and there are some people who don't know enough. And they're the people I worry about. Of the, course, the fringe. That's what I was going to anyway, say. Robert, I want to uh, please call often, and I appreciate the call very, very much. So again, two zero one two four two eleven forty two, and one of the things that I think you and I have to discuss is what is the level of anti-Semitism in America? Because my own experience is there is no anti-Semitism. Well, well, there is so little anti-Semitism in America. And I know every now and then somebody says to me, again, Mark, you're being naive. It's under the surface. I don't feel it. I don't see it. I don't experience it. I don't talk to people who come to me and tell me, oh, let me tell you about an anti-Semitic event that I experienced. At the same time, there's an anti-Israel bias. It tends to be associated with the left. As a, as, an, as a kid who grew up as a liberal, as a, I consider myself to be on the liberal side of the social spectrum. I don't understand why, in any sense, what's called the liberal left is less sensitive to the plight Israel experiences and must deal with, and in some way seems to only side with the Palestinian, and it could stop the conflict could stop. There could be peace. There's a side that has a leadership, a leadership, which simply does not want the state of Israel to exist. And at the moment, there's a leadership which is going to try to rain rockets down on Israel as much as it can so that Israel retaliates in such a way that, lo and behold, the press sides with the Palestinians. The New York Times has become an agent of Hamas. Don't they see that? They did exactly what Hamas wanted them to do. We go back to the phones. Ria, Ria, welcome. I, I wasn't told where you're from, Ria. I'm from Rycliffe Manor, New York. Thank you for joining us. What are your thoughts? I just want to say, I want to thank you and say thank God for you and for Shalom TV for telling the truth about what's going on. Thank you, Ria. And the fact that I can't watch any network news anymore. I will not watch the bias. I cannot stand it. It makes me so upset, and I've had somebody uh, who works with me praising CNN and praising Brian Williams. I'm trying to tell her it's not that way. They're biased against Israel, and it's kind of hard to convince some people. Yes, it is. And as you say, it becomes very frustrating and very difficult to watch. And I'm going to take your compliment, and I'm going to take your compliment very, very seriously, and I want you to know, uh, all the people who are in the control room and who are in the studio and who help put this program together. And really, this is an enormous effort by Shalom TV to be really on the air with you continually throughout the day. And uh, we feel there's a commitment here. Shalom TV is a singular voice at the moment on all of American television. And I, I don't understand why every cable sim system in the, comp in the country, every television provider right now doesn't have Shalom TV. And I'm speaking specifically because we're in the New York area about Time Warner. We're going to take one more quick call. We only have a minute. We're going to go to Reunion City and I welcome another Robert. Robert, give me a few seconds, please. A few seconds. Robert, are you there? Yes, I'm there. I'm here. Robert? Okay. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Quickly, yeah. Robert, what is your point? 
My point is that your channel has been absolutely Baruch Hashem to you. Thank well, you. I just wanted to compliment you and the whole channel and all the people that you have been, I've been following. You know, I'm getting a little smile from you, um, Rabbi Golub. You are the, the, uh, the gem that, is, that are bringing us the news every day and every night. And I could see the feeling and, 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 the, and the look that you have in your eyes when you speak to these people. It means so, it means so much for me to listen to you and to uh, just thank all of your people. Thank you. And that's the nice part, by the way. Thank you, Robert. I'm glad I put you on. Um, it just gives me a chance to say um, one more time. You know, if you're watching Shalom to you, certainly there are a whole group of people you see all the time. Tisha Bader does a fabulous job. Every night she's on between 6 and 6.30, and then we repeat her. But she does a fabulous job. Ron Jacobson was with you today giving you an update. He produces much of the stuff we're doing now. He does a fabulous job. Sloan Copeland is our director. He is a genius. Serge Goldberg puts this together as the production coordinator. Another genius. Dara Golub. She happens to be my daughter. It's not her fault. She's the associate director here. She's out of this world. And then we've got, you know, Carol Lilienthal helping us to produce. We've got uh, Igor Funk behind the camera. We've got people all over, up and down. We've got Mark Baker and Corey Sivikov who are in master control. It, without them, we don't get on the air. All these, and I have to tell you, we're almost out of time. I have to tell you something. You know, we go on the air and we have a sense of what's going to happen during the day. And then Israel sends ground troops into Gaza. And I say to the, to the staff, you have to stay late tonight. I want to go on the air at 7 o'clock because I want people brought up to date. And I want to deal with this New York Times story, which Audrey Frankenberg, thank you for getting, make sure I saw that story. This is what we're doing, but it's, it's them. They get the credit. And I, all, all, you know, I say this, I don't mean it as a saccharine way. You get the credit too. Thank you for being part of this community. And those, and, and you know, the people who call and, and who say such lovely things, you energize us, you affirm what we do, and we'll continue to do it. I am, I am absolutely committed to bring you this information day after day, and I don't care what anybody says. You're going to hear the truth on Shalom TV. Thank you, my friends. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. <laughs>